Hey, I'm Mike Bruce, the founder and CEO of Visible. As you scale your company, having the right guides at your side can make all of the difference. Each episode, we'll talk to fellow founders, investors, and experts. We'll dive into their zone of genius, as well as hear about their past mistakes to give you a better chance of success. This podcast is for founders by founders. This is the Founders Forward. What's up, everyone? Uh, today, I'm joined by Lisa Besserman. Uh, she's the managing d- director of Expo currently, uh, part of their pre-seed accelerator program and pre-seed investments. Uh, she's also a mentor for Google Startups. Uh, in her past life, she's been an economist with the Department of Labor, uh, a startup operator herself, the founder and executive uh, director of Startup Buenos Aires, and the head of uh, Indeed's global accelerator program before uh, she was uh, the, the managing director, managing director of Expa, uh, Lisa, welcome. Thanks for, for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Mike. How was the intro? Did I miss anything? Nope, all good. All right, so what's it like being an economist? That was pretty interesting. I saw that on your LinkedIn. Yeah, it's funny. I didn't last very long in, in government. Uh, <laughs> you know, if, if you're in startups, I think it'd be hard uh, to enjoy life in, in, in government. Um, you know, I'm, I'm all about disruption and meritocracy and working, you know, working smart, not hard. Uh, and with the government, it's, um, it's very much like you're, you're rated on how long you've sat in a seat and how you've kept everything status quo. So sure. I didn't last very long. I, it was, uh, it was my first job back after I lived abroad and, um, yeah, I didn't last very long in government. It was just not for me. I like disrupting things. I like breaking a bunch of stuff and fixing them and finding new solutions. And that is definitely not the ethos of uh, government work. So, so you mentioned you lived abroad. Uh, you currently call Austin home, but I guess it's like you're pretty like worldly, like obviously based on your, your previous experiences, like w- were you born in the United States or how did that all happen where, you know, you, you were in Buenos Aires for a while and in different places all over the world? Yeah. So I was uh, born in, born and raised in New York city. Um, and, uh, I studied international business at university and right after university, I was, you know, at that pivotal moment, like, I don't know what I want to do with my life. And I had a bunch of interviews set up at like large financial institutions, many of which don't exist today after the financial crisis. Um, it was like 2008, 2009. Um, but I had some interviews set up at Goldman Sachs, Lehman brothers, Bear Stearns. And I just thought like the American dream is make a shit ton of money. Um, sell your soul, um, hate your life, but you have a lot of money. So that's, that's, that's the dream. Um, that's what I thought. And then I, t- I took a backpacking trip to Europe and I realized, you know, there's so much more to life and you can enjoy life. Um, you know, it's not about uh, living to work. It's about working to live. Um, and so after some time in Europe, I had, you know, that was right after I graduated college and I was, you know, I had all these interviews lined up and I was ready to join corporate America and something inside of me was just like, don't do it. You're, you're so young, like see the world, do things. And I've always loved to travel. And yeah. so uh, a friend of mine told me about um, an opportunity in Japan, uh, teaching English in Japan. And I don't love teaching, um, but the idea of living in a foreign country in, like, in Asia, which I knew nothing about, Um, And I just thought it could be just such an incredible learning experience. And for me, it was like, how can I validate um, traveling the world, but still have a line on my resume? Um, Mm -hmm. So it's not as though I'm just like a vagabond traveling. I mean, at at one point while I was in Europe in this, you know, vision quest, I had told my parents I was going to um, stay in Rome and get a job at a hostel. And they're like, absolutely not. Uh, That is not going to happen. So they crushed those dreams. And so rather than getting a job as a bartender at a hostel, I wound up applying and um, got a role as an English teacher in Japan. And then six weeks later, I was uh, shipped out to Asia and I spent a couple of years in Japan um, living and working there. And, you know, I was, you know, fresh out of college, 21, 22 years old. And, and that just opened my eyes to the incredible opportunities of, of living and working abroad. And, um, you know, because I did study international business, that was really just something I was very passionate about. And after about two years in Asia, I did a lot of traveling, came back to the States, did that small stint in government work. And then I was, um, my my eyes were open to the wonderful world of startups. And so I started working at a startup, a tech startup. Um, And this was back, I'm going to date myself, but this is back in like 2009, 2010. Um, So it was right when New York was becoming known as like Silicon Alley, Um, you know, still the earlier days of like sexy tech and, and entrepreneurship. And so I worked, um, worked at a startup, uh, loved it, loved everything about working at a startup, the scrappiness, um, just wearing multiple hats, working with teams that were distributed, um, working in technology. And um, then after a few years, I was just 
tired of the New York winters. It is just way too cold. And um, asked my company if I could work remotely for a few months just to avoid the New York winter. They said, yes. I looked at a map. I was like, okay, where is it warm? And where can I be in a similar time zone? And then that's where I came up with Buenos Aires, Argentina. Uh, didn't speak a word of Spanish. Didn't know anybody in the country, but for me, it was like, um, it was a mini adventure. It was only going to be two or three months. So I packed a, a suitcase and a laptop and went down to Buenos Aires and uh, that, you know, continued my international career. But was it, uh, weren't you down there for like years? Yeah. So I was supposed to be down there. Yeah. It's good. Good point. So I was supposed to be down there for uh, two or three months max. And, um, you know, I was working remotely. And if I'm being completely honest, I was actually hiding my location. I told them I was going to live with my grandmother in Florida because I knew if I told them I was going somewhere cool, they would never let me go. And sure. I live with my grandma in Florida. They're like, yeah, sure, whatever. So I learned more about like VPNs and rerouting through Miami servers to hide my location and like points over IPs with Miami area codes. Like I went through great lengths to hide my location to keep my job. Um, and so, you know, after about three months in, in Buenos Aires, at some point, I was just meeting a ton of entrepreneurs. I was trying to get involved with the local community. And I realized there was just an abundance of uh, lack of resources. So there's an incredible amount of human capital, like resilient and tenacious entrepreneurs, lots of tech talent, but no resources. It was mm -hmm. a very fragmented space, very challenging to navigate. And so, you know, seeing these things and connecting the dots, I, um, you know, I thought, like, why don't I just connect people with resources and build like a little community or a hub for founders by founders. And this was meant to be a side project. This was not, you know, I didn't, there was no business model. There was no scalability. Like I, I didn't know what I was doing. Um, I just wanted to make some friends and help some people out in, in the process. And um, it was, you know, at, at that point it was close to time to return home. And I remember speaking with a good friend of mine, Andy Ryan, we were, we were in, in Buenos Aires, he was an entrepreneur as well. And I told him, you know, this is what I'm building. This is what I started. I was like, but I have to go home. So, you know, I guess it's over. He's like, don't go home, like quit your job, do this full time. Like you're sitting on something really great and you can make an incredible impact here. And I was like, I don't, I don't know anything about entrepreneurship. Like I don't, I'm like, I, I have like $30,000 to my name. Like I can't invest all my money and, and like build this thing. And, you know, at the time, like th there wasn't that much financial capital, at least not as much yeah. as, as there is today in, in venture, especially not in Latin America. So I was bootstrapping everything. And um, it was one of those moments where I was like, if I don't do this, I might regret it for the rest of my life. If I do it and I fail, at least I'll learn a ton. I'll meet like, meet incredible people and I'll spend some time in, in Argentina. And if it fails, I can just go home. I can go back to New York at any point, I'll have a job. And so I wound up um, resigning from my role. This is at the three month mark. I put my life savings into building uh, what became Startup Buenos Aires, which then evolved to become an early stage startup accelerator. Um, and like the, one of the biggest startup communities in Latin America. And so through that, we were able to help thousands of entrepreneurs and provide free education, community tools, resources, connections, work with large companies like Uber and Facebook and WeWork that wanted to come to Argentina, and then also provide financial capital to, um, to entrepreneurs throughout Latin America. That's, I mean, that's insane. I've been looking, I was looking through your Twitter feed recently, and it seems like you have like, a huge passion for Latin America. Was that just born out of your time there? Or uh, I, I'm just curious, because like, it seems like you're, you're super excited by the Latin American space personally. Was that just formed by, by the, the time that you spent uh, in, in Buenos Aires? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just living down there, I, you know, I, I wound up, you know, I was supposed to stay there two months, three months, stayed five years. And just being exposed to the resilient entrepreneurs and just, just the sheer, like, brilliance and tenacity that these entrepreneurs had, but the lack of resources they had because of where they lived, um, it really just, it, it really set a fire in me in terms of like, I want to help these people. Like there's so much potential here and there's just so much greatness here, um, but there's just not enough resources. There's not enough financial capital. There's not enough education. There's just not enough opportunities. Yeah. Um, so living there and meeting people and becoming friends with them and just helping them any way that I could, it, it really just enabled me to see like the, the human capital and, and just like the greatness that lives in Latin America. And so I've been betting on Latin America for the past 10 years. Now it's becoming cool. Like now there's, there's so much venture going into, going yeah. into Latin, especially with SoftBank and there's just so much going on. And there's a lot more VCs that are existing and popping up in Latin America, which I really appreciate because, you know, human capital is borderless. Like there is, I mean, like talent is borderless, like great entrepreneurs are everywhere. 
And now with, you know, with the, with how we've evolved because of COVID and just how things are becoming, you know, just more accessible and, and remote, where you are location wise matters less. And I love that because there is just so much talent everywhere around the world and, and where you are shouldn't determine what your opportunities are. Totally agree. I mean, I'm super biased because we started visible uh, fully remote back in 2014. So half, the, curve, half, yeah. half of the team uh, doesn't even live in the United States. So uh, I, I, I definitely agree. Uh, I want to jump into Expo because Expo is your, 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 your current role. Uh, for those of those of, of the listeners that don't know, uh, Expo is a fund. It was started by Garrett Camp, one of the Uber co-founders. Expo is also an accelerator uh, as well as a venture studio. Uh, one of my favorite products in the world, I tell everyone to use is Metabase. Uh, Metabase was born out of uh, the studio, I believe. They just raised like a $30 million uh, round. Uh, Sleeper, uh, awesome uh, fantasy app. I think that was part of the, the accelerator, right? That was the accelerator, yeah. That's yeah, great. Sleeper just raised a $40 million round. So clearly, Expo knows what's up. Um, mm -hmm. how, how do all those pieces fit, fit together, by the way? The fund, the accelerator, the studio, it, do they fit together or are they meant to be kind of three separate things? So we, we treat them as three pillars. So essentially, when Garrett built Expo, like, he was like, I want to build a venture fund that I wish existed when I was building Uber. <laughs> Um, and so we are very founder first in terms of our principles and our ethos and most of the partners and, and in terms of most of the team are previous entrepreneurs, builders, operators, you know, we're not, we're not investment bankers, um, you know, we come from, from experience, we know what it takes to build a company, we know the challenges, we know the obstacles and the opportunities and the pitfalls. And so when he built out Expo, it was originally meant to be, you know, the place he wished existed. And so it started as a venture studio where they were building a bunch of cool things. Um, then they evolved to be more of a traditional venture fund. So they're, they're investing in, in seed to series A. And then they recognize that there's so much potential and, and talent in pre-seed. And so they wanted to help support pre-seed founder, founders. And so then they built the accelerator program. And that's what I'm... Um, very fortunate to, to be able to run and, and lead. And so they're, they all operate as, as separate entities within the same ecosystem, within the same yeah. you know, organization, but there's always collaboration. You know, like we have a lot of our seed founders, you know, mentoring or working with our pre-seed founders, you know, series A helping out our seed. Um, so there's, we're just one big family. Um, and, you know, our offices, we're, we're, we're in uh, LA, San Francisco, New York and London. And so in those offices, at least pre-COVID and hopefully post-COVID, it's a hodgepodge of people at all different stages, working together, collaborating, and it's just a really great family and community environment. How's the accelerator set up for, for the, the listeners? Is it like a typical cohort model? Is it you come when you want, is it time-based? Like how are, how is the uh, accelerator structured? Yeah, so it's a much different model than than anything out there. Um, you know, where everybody, where all the accelerators, we said we joke around and say, like, where all the accelerators are like zigging, we're zagging. Um, so we are not cohort, not curriculum based, no programmatic content. It really is just a custom program for the needs of entrepreneurs because we recognize that each founder is at a different state. Um, you know, there might be seasoned entrepreneurs, they might be first time entrepreneurs, we, you know, we invest, we're agnostic. So we invest in a ton of different sectors and verticals. And we realize it's not a one size fits all model. And that's the mm -hmm. problem with a lot of the accelerators. They, they create this one size fits all model and they, they invest in a ton of startups. So then resources are really limited. And so when you're, when you have demo day, you're sharing a stage with 300 other people, it's really hard to stand out. It's really hard to get partner time. And so what we've done is essentially taken all of the great elements of accelerators like the resources, like the support, um, you know, like the, the community um, and the funding. And then we've taken off what, what we feel might be just superfluous or just not as valuable, um, like the time-based uh, accelerators or mm -hmm. the cohort model or like a strict timeline or large cohorts. And so what we've done is essentially created a, like a one-of-a-kind accelerator program where it's, it's totally custom and bestoke, bespoke to the entrepreneur. Um, so if they need help with, let's say hiring or product road mapping, uh, or customer discovery, whatever it is, we provide them that support. We have a full-time team. We meet with them on either a weekly or bi-weekly or monthly cadence. They decide, um, and then they have access to our partners, our resources, our community. And so essentially we're creating a program, um, and it's custom to each startup that comes into the program. And we've committed to only invest in 15 or less startups per year. So we're able okay. to 
them those resources and give them that full-time support. Um, so they're not one of many, they're, they're individual and we treat them as such. Can I, how does the resources work? Can I use them indefinitely or is there kind of time for those? Is that like, yeah, you get to talk to us once a week for a year or six months or three weeks. Like, what does that look like? That's a great question. So we don't have a timeline. So we recognize, you know, some people are ready to raise in three months. Some people are ready to raise the next round in nine months. Some people get acquired in a year, whatever it might be. So there's no like kick out date. You know, there's no like D like D day. It's, it's, yeah. um, we, we you're, once you're in the family or in the family, um, you know, we have someone, we have a, a start and we also do follow on investing. So it's, it's not uncommon to come in as a pre-seed and then we invest in seed and we work with you. Um, so yeah, once you're in, you're in, there's really no time that we kick you out. And whenever you're ready to raise your seed, we make sure that we're supporting you and helping you and inviting the right investors to um, connect you with and then helping you with your pitch and making sure that you're reading, reaching your product milestones and whatever it might be. Um, we take a very hands-on approach to the next phase as well. Yeah, I was going to ask that because like, I think, at least to me, uh, I, I haven't done an accelerator personally, but from the outside looking in, it seems like a big benefit of some of the bigger accelerators is like the demo day in the sense that there's hundreds of investors there, right? So you have a, a very captive audience. Like, how do you guys replicate that, like, that model of bringing investors to the, the companies? So we don't want to replicate the model. We want to create our own. Um, so what we're doing is being very targeted. So we'll work with the startups in our in our program, and we'll be like, who is your ideal investor? And we very frequently co-invest with Tier One, you know, A sixteen Z, Sequoia, Bessemer, First Round. Like we very frequently co-invest. So we have a lot of friends in the industry. And so what we'll do is work with the, the founders and say, give us your targeted list. Let us know who you want to invest, um, who you want to be your investor. Because a lot of the times, founders are not just looking for financial partners. They're looking for strategic partners. And we want them to choose the best investors for the long term, because it is a marriage. Um, and so we just want to make sure that they have the right group of people um, hearing their pitch. And so what we'll do is we'll do actual introductions. And so we'll, we'll walk them through, we'll connect them. So it's more of a one-on-one -on -one rather than like a one-to-many environment. You're not on a stage, you're not a part of a, you know, a timeline, you know, you're not, you don't have three minutes to captivate the investor's attention. What we'll do is we'll actually introduce you to investors in our network that would be a good fit for you based on the investors that you're targeting. So it's a very one-to-one -one type. Uh, yeah, that's awesome. Uh, let's say I'm a founder, uh, I'm sorry, first time founder, and I'm like, did the, the accelerator, you know, model is right for me. What should I look for when I'm evaluating, you know, different accelerators and programs out there? Like, how should I get the most out of my time at those accelerators? Like, what should I be looking for? Uh, I mean, you, 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 you've started, I think you've been part of at least three from what I can tell. So I'm, I'm sure you got some interesting insights in terms of what founders should look for and yeah. what, what really works. Yeah. I mean, it really comes down to recognizing what you need as a founder where you are, where your product is like some, I mean, and, and all accelerators are not created equally. And I think that there's incredible value to every accelerator. It's just, is it the value that you need to get yourself to the next level? So it's like, if you need help with product or if you're pre-product, like you want a more hands-on accelerator. Um, if, you know, maybe if you're a first time entrepreneur, you want the curriculum, you want to keep, you know, you want to, you know, have that cohort based, you want that timeline. Um, so it's really just recognizing like, what do you need as a founder to become successful? What is your startup need? What stage are you in? And what are the resources that would help you get from, you know, zero to one most quickly? And then finding, I think it's like about reverse engineering. It's not like about looking for accelerators. It's more about looking to see where you are and what you need to become successful and then finding an accelerator that fits that model, whether it's uh, having that curriculum or having, you know, that demo day or, you know, having a more bespoke or custom solution. It really depends on where you are and, and what's valuable to you. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, I, I'd love to get into some of the, the coaching around let's call it pre-seed companies where you're going to help raise seed, maybe even uh, invest in those companies and, and get into some of the dynamics to help some of the founders listening. Um, there's kind of two schools of thought, I guess, when it comes to, to fundraising and there's like the, you're always fundraising, right? And there's like the, the quote unquote, never be raising. I'd be curious to hear like, how do you guys coach your pre-seed companies that you're, you know, doing the bespoke accelerator model with? Like, how do you, how do you, what do you coach them on, on, on here's what's going to make you successful when you're raising your seed round? 
Yeah, I mean, um, what we do, because it's not as though like we write a check, sit back, wait, and then when it's time for to raise seed, we're like, okay, here's what you, we think you should do. Like we're, mm-hmm. we're meeting them every week or, you know, every other week. Um, so we're working with them on their product roadmap, on their milestones, on telling their story. And, and I don't think that there's a specific equation that we're like, you need to hit this metric, you need to have this amount of users, sure. you need to have this amount of revenue to get to the seed. What it really is, is are you telling your story effectively? Like, is your team the right team to build this? Is your problem space big enough? And if we feel that we're ready, that we're there with, with whether it's on the product side or on the user side or on the ARR or whatever it might be, then we'll, we'll help shepherd you into the seed, seed round and seed funding. But I don't think that there's, you know, like it's, it's not, I think contrary to popular belief, it's not as though investors, especially, you know, at the seed stage are looking for specific metrics to be met. We don't have like a number in mind. It's really, what's the story? What's the team? And can this be big? Can this give venture size returns? When you guys put them in the, and do you guys have like a playbook you run when you're like, great, we feel like we took the box on all three of those things. Is it like, we're going to set two weeks of meetings and, and help get as many intros as possible to run those two weeks of meetings? Like, is there a, a process that you guys like to follow uh, once you feel like you have the, the story in place? Sure. Um, so because we are so custom, we don't have a playbook for all, it's, there's no one size fits all. So for example, one of the startups in our pre-seed, um, they're actually skipping, they're doing so well, they're skipping seed and going straight to series A. And so we started doing introductions. We started you know, giving them pointers and like sending them series A decks to look at and to coach them and train them on how to raise a series A. Um, you know, for others, we started warm intros early. So like we have some friends, you know, just in the, in the, in the, in the ecosystem, we're like, talk to our, you know, they're going to raise an X amount of months, start having these like conversations to build these relationships. So it really depends on where the startup is, what they're looking to accomplish. If they want to act, start activating these relationships early, or if they want to hold off until the product Mm -hmm. is developed before they do that. So it really depends on the startup itself. There's no, at least for us, there's no one size fits all playbook at this stage. Yeah. Are you guys with the accelerator? Is it, um, it's, 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 I think it's remote, right? Is it virtual? Or are you in one of the offices uh, or is it global, completely remote companies that you guys will, will have in? So it's global, completely remote. We do have our office, like our, our office HQs and our, like we have offices, as I mentioned in uh, New York, LA, San Francisco and London. So anybody that gets accepted to the program, if they happen to be in one of those cities, they're welcome to come in, work from those offices, be a part of the community, like IRL, um, but we don't discriminate um, based on location. So they can do this remotely. All of the work we do is remote. You know, I'm in Austin, there's no hub there. Um, so, you know, our, our team is distributed. So it really, it, wherever you are, you have an opportunity to be a part of the program. How have you, how, how are the dynamics played out, say for an international founder uh, raising capital versus Silicon Valley, Bay Area, San Francisco, like, are, are those worlds kind of blending now and, and that's gone or is it still more difficult for say one of your international teams that's in the accelerator to raise versus maybe someone that's local in the Bay Area? That's a good question. I think COVID has really rocked the system and changed the way that we look at investing and ventures and even building teams, you know, like you needed mm-hmm. to have your team in, in SF where you were and like, that's so expensive. Um, so much of your, you know, your investment would go into, to, you know, building a team locally, whereas you don't need to be co-located anymore. You can, everybody's doing things remotely, you know, before, like in order to raise, you had to be in a tier one city to have access to tier one investors. But when we're looking at investments, we're looking everywhere in the world now, because I think COVID has reduced the, or like eliminated these borders in some Mm -hmm. regard. And, you know, I think, VCs have recognized that there's great talent everywhere in the world. And if we're limiting ourselves to just tier one cities or specific cities like the Bay Area or New York City or Boston or whatever it might be, we're limiting ourselves to potentially incredible investments and incredible founders. Yeah, uh, that's awesome. What about, um, I, w- I want to get into like the, the, the process for uh, Expa and, and in particular the accelerator program. So what are you looking for? Because uh, I think you have two two different kind of options, right? It's at least from what I've seen on the website. There's the I think 250k for seven percent, 400k for ten. Um, but what are you looking for? Is it team? Is it the three things you mentioned, or 
do you guys, is it, you're, you're pretty agnostic if someone catches your eye, you, you might be interested in, in, in that company. Yeah, I mean, so we evaluate based on you know, the, the general things that VCs evaluate on, um, you know, it's problem space, is this a big enough problem space, um, team, is this the team to build it, and then just like overall, like, how do we feel about this market, how do we feel about the market evolution, do we feel like this could be big enough to reach, you know, millions of people or create billions in revenue, whatever it might be. Um, so we, you know, we take a multifaceted approach to evaluation. Uh, one thing that you'll notice I didn't mention is the product itself. I mean, some, yeah, of course, like we look at the product, but we also recognize like we're investing in people, not products. Products change. Mm -hmm. Look, the greatest products today were not what they were. Um, they at least did not start that way. So for us, I'd say the biggest thing that we're evaluating is the people, is the team. Do we believe in the team? Is this team coachable? Um, do they have, do they know something that other people don't like, are they subject matter experts and do they love the problem enough? Um, you know, so many times, and I say this in pretty much every interview, um, but I always tell founders like fall in love with the problem, not the solution. And so what we want to make sure is, is that they absolutely love the problem, like marry the problem, date the solution, the solution, you have to be open to change based on, you know, user feedback and interviews and just, you know, product market fit, whatever it might be. Um, but I'd say when we're evaluating, it's people first, um, product second. How do, you, uh, how do you guys go about, is it, uh, what's like the best way for a founder to reach out? Is it cold? Is it an application process? Is it an intro to yourself or someone on the team? Like if I'm like, oh yeah, I think I, this, this sounds interesting. What's the best way to, to get in touch with, with Expa? Sure, so at the pre-seed, we do require all startups to go through the application process because it is a program. Uh, we do have an investment committee that goes through all of the applications on a weekly basis. Um, so definitely I would route people to the Expa website. Um, it's just expa.com uh, apply slash apply. Um, and then, you know, in terms of just in general, like sentiment about when you're going through the investment process, warm intros are always the best. Uh, we do answer every cold email. Like we do have a, a cold email address that people send decks to. And if we find the decks compelling enough, we will respond, um, especially at the seed stage and above. Uh, Pre-seed will always root everybody to the application process. Um, but I'd say just like general for, for your audiences, if you are raising and there is an investor that you have targeted that you wanna work with, look through your network, look through LinkedIn, find out how you're related to them or how you're connected to them, like tangentially or directly, because a warm intro can go, go a very, very long way. Yeah, what, uh, these are kind of, this is that's actually a good segue to, to questions we ask all of our guests. So I think a good, uh, amount of our audience might be under networked or, or underrepresented and so they might not have a warm intro and, and so cold might be the only route what catches your eye uh in a, in a cold email like what are you most likely to respond to that's a great question um i'd say it's less about the content of the email more about the deck so sometimes people will just write an email and just give an intro and then be like you know, respond if you're interested, but that it's very likely that they, the, you know, VCs are very busy people. They won't necessarily respond to emails like that. I would say include your deck in there. And then some of the things that people forget to do in their decks or don't highlight enough is um, how much they're looking to raise. Cause like when, when we're, we're at a fund, we're all getting the email, um, you know, and we, we invest anywhere from pre-seed to series A. So there's a, a vast difference in the size of the checks. So if you're sending us a deck, but you're not specifying how much you want to raise, it's really difficult to, for us to get back to you or to root you to the right person on the team. So I'd say definitely include the investment amount of what you're looking to raise. And then another thing is the team. Like I said, like we, we put so much emphasis um, in the team. It's like, is this the team to build it? And sometimes people don't include a slide on the team. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people just put photos or, or names. It's like, no highlight the team, like the team slide is the most important slide, um, probably more important than the products um, or like the problem. Um, so I'd say, or well, product, I'm sorry, problem and, and team is pretty neck and neck, but um, I'd say it's it's not just about like what's in the email. That's like, I skim through those. It's really, what's the deck? I look at every single deck that comes to my, um, that comes into my inbox, cold, warm, whatever it might be. And I give them you know, similar weights. So if you don't have a network, that's fine. Send a cold email, but make sure you're including the deck and make sure you have the right content in the deck to share because you only get one shot a lot of the time. Is there, a, is there like 10 slides, 15 slides? Is there like shorter the better? 
No, I mean, it's like the longer, the not better. <laughs> like <laughs> you've definitely gotten like 40 slide, uh, like decks. Uh, I definitely don't recommend 40 slides. I, you know, it's like, it's, there, there's really no equation. I'd say, you know, anywhere between like 10 and 20 is, is fine. 10 and 15. Um, but definitely not more than like 25. Yeah. What, uh, so team's an interesting one. I, I wonder about this. Um, say I'm a first time founder. I don't have a pedigree, right? I, I didn't work at Google or Facebook or Amazon. Uh, I didn't go to Harvard. Like, how can I make myself stick out in the team slide in a static way, right? Like I'm sending you a deck. I'm not in front of a video camera or, or talking to you real time. Like how can I best represent myself or my team through a pitch deck if I don't have like crazy pedigree? Sure, that's a good question. Um, first off, when I hire people and when I invest in people, I don't care about your university. Like it's just a college. Like, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of weight to like people who went to certain universities. I'm not one of those people. It's really not, it's not, it's not about the pedigree to me. It's about the story. So it's, it's, if, when I say team, I'm not saying like you had to have worked at Google or you had to have gone to Stanford. It's no, how does your story equip you to be the right person to build this thing? What did you experience or what makes you a subject matter expert? I mean, one of the best decks I ever received and we, we had a call with them right away. Um, was about, uh, it was a mental health startup. And in the deck, the founder told his story, his journey um, with mental health and how he struggled through it and how he's come out of it and what he's learned from it and why he built this product or this solution for people like him. And so the, his background, like it didn't matter like where he worked, it was his story that was so compelling and captivating to us because we're like, this is the guy who's passionate about the problem. And we want to talk to him because his story resonates and because he was vulnerable and because he shared this information. Um, and we know that he's going to build it much better than anybody who went to Google, who like, you know, worked at Google or whatever it might be, because his story is the thing that connects to what he's building. So I'd say like, it doesn't necessarily matter. Like if you don't have the pedigree, you don't have the background, but your story resonates with investors, or it shows that you have a subject matter expertise or a true passion in this area, let that come out in the deck. Story is so important. Do you, got, do you have any other storytellers or other examples that you just love of just like someone that has done an amazing job telling a story? Yeah, um, we have another startup that we invested in. So there's so there's quite a few. One, one of them, we have two mental health um, that we were really interested in and, and both of them were telling their stories and, and they were just like, also mental health is such an important space right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, not right now, just in general. Um, and it's something that we all believe in here. So we understand like the impact and the value of it. So, you know, that we've had founders with their stories, like share um, their journeys, which was really valuable. And then on the other side, on the tech side, we had a, a startup that we invested in. Um, the founder was um, early stage sales at a lot of big like tech companies that became huge. So he came in early and then build out these, you know, huge tech companies on the sales side. So he, we knew he had like the biz dev chops. We knew he had the sales chops and he had, you know, thousands of one-on-one -on -one meetings, thousands of team meetings. And he realized like meetings are broken and there's no solution to solve like meetings and managers and make people better managers. And so given his experience, like with, um, you know, scaling sales teams and having thousands of meetings, he essentially built, or he's built in the process of building a, a product that helps with one-on-one -on -one meetings um, and helps people become better managers. But we liked his story and the fact that like, yeah, he's had thousands. I mean, he, part, one of his slides was like, I've had 4,000 meetings um, and this is what I've learned and this is what's broken and this is what I want to fix. Uh, you got to say that I love one-on-ones. I, I think they're highly important to, to being a great leader and, uh, and building a great team. I always love to hear what other people do for one on one. So you got, you're gonna have to send me the company when yeah, it's ready sure. to go because I would love, I'd love to check it out. <laughs> yeah, once we launch the product, I'd be happy to get you on. Awesome. Okay, last question: What's next for you guys uh, at Expa when it comes to the accelerator space? Kind of pre seed investments. You mentioned uh, you zig when you zag. What are things that you're thinking about uh, that maybe aren't being done today that that have some level of interest to you guys? Yeah, that's a question. I mean, we're still so so new. We 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 had a soft launch just a, a couple months ago, so I think we're still trying to determine how we want to scale, um, but remaining um, small at the same time. So it's yeah. about finding that balance of like picking the winners and working with the founders and adding that incredible amount of value 
but also being able to scale out the model that we can do this for many, many years and, and provide a ton of support to, to founders. I mean, one of the things that I'm working on personally um, and, and with Expo, I'm very grateful that they've gotten behind this initiative is the underrepresented founder series. So, you know, I, I was a female founder in a foreign country, so I checked off all the boxes of being underrepresented. And I think that there's just a ton of incredible founders that don't have the same opportunity as, as those do in either tier one cities or with those pedig with that pedigree. Um, and oftentimes they just don't have access to, to, to venture capital. You know, like when you think of women, we only, like women only get 2% of venture funding or BIPOC founders only get 2.6% of venture funding. And so what I've created and, and what Expa has created is essentially this underrepresented founder series where we're having events, um, but providing resources and creating a space where underrepresented founders can meet other investors in a situation where they're not pitching, where they're just building the relationships or learn from an experienced founder. So actually I flew into New York for this event. It was um, female founders and funders. And so we had a panel with um, four incredible female founders, anywhere from pre-seed to series A. Um, and they told their story and we were asking them questions and um, we did a, a large Q and A at the end. And um, it was only women. So it was a curated group, only women um, or, or female identifying founders. Um, came and then they were able to learn from these women's experiences. We had like a nail salon come in and, and do some nails. So it was just like a fun, dynamic, different type of event. Um, and we're working on quite a few. So uh, another one that I'm very passionate about is, is Latinx. So um, having an event with them and like we are, uh, I judged pitch competition in, in Austin for uh, Latinx. And so essentially what we're doing is creating this series of underrepresented founders to not only provide an event um, not only provide some sort of a networking capability, but also resources, and then giving them the opportunity to connect with other um, VCs and other people in their field and peers and to build a community that adds actual value. Um, and that's something that Expo has gotten behind. You know, most of Expo's partners are, are immigrants. Um, you know, a lot of Expo's leadership um, are, are are um are immigrants and um you know i'm a female found i'm a, I'm a female you know I'm, I'm part of the leadership team so we do understand the value of diversity inclusion and belonging and so you know a lot of a lot of venture firms are saying yeah we we under we see we've seen the stats like diversity investment is very important to us um and they wait for those founders to find them but what we're trying to do is go and find those founders go to those communities or build out those communities provide the resources um, that they need instead of just, you know, hosting a networking event or saying we're open to invest in them. But what we want to do is take it one step further and go to where they are and provide the resources that they need. And so to so anybody who's listening, if you are an underrepresented founder and you have an idea for how we can help you or how we can host an event that really adds value to what you're building, like, please get in touch. I love it. What a great way to end. Uh, Lisa, thank you so much for your time, uh, sharing your story, sharing some great tips for founders raising the pre-seed seed round. Uh, and we hope to catch you soon. Great. Thank you so much for having awesome. me. If anybody's interested, please feel free to check out expa.com. Awesome. Thanks, Lisa.